Hello, City Hope. You guys are looking good. Thanks for choosing to worship with us this weekend. And I want you to know that worship was incredible today. And I hope all the campuses experienced the same thing. So thank you for being with us. I want to welcome the Mobile Campus, Foley Campus, Baymanette, and all the guys at Holman. Thank you for being part of our weekend experience. Uh, I'm going to wrap up a series entitled Yours for the Taking. If you've missed this, you can go back and watch it, listen to it. I encourage you to do so. If you're falling in on the tail end of this, this may lose you just a little bit where I'm going today. But I, I want to kind of preface this final message. Uh, as you know, if you've been around, the end of the year, the Lord kind of gives me direction, some insight, little revelation, some prophetic views of things of where we're going as a church. And I told you at the beginning of the year that this is a year, as we began the series, I told you, this is a year for us to step into our promises, that as a church for 18 years, we've been sowing and planting here and abroad, and we're going to step into some promises. And also in that, and I didn't share that with you in its entirety, but also in that, the other part of this was the Lord spoke to me, and it was basically was saying, okay, this year I want you to focus all, all the stuff you got going on, all, all the outreach, all, all the ministries, everything, that's good. But I want you to pay particular attention to marriages and children. I want you to look. I want us to focus this year. So I said all that to say we've gone through five messages in this series. And to me, this is the bottom line of the series, this last message. We've talked about faith. We've talked about facing the wall. And we've, we've talked about the, uh, the, gra- the changing your thinking because that Jericho wall is symbolic of strongholds in our mind. We've talked about half-hearted obedience. We've talked about walking in obedience that we can possess the promise today. I talked about that last weekend. Uh, this weekend, this, the message of this, this message is entitled Promised Land Babies. And I'll explain what that means as we get into it. So let, let me go ahead and get into it. Let, let me roll back from Joshua because that's the story you've been looking at and studying. You roll back from Joshua. You go back to Moses. God told Moses to pick 12 men from each of the 12 tribes, send them in as spies to the promised land, and we've talked about that a little bit. But the same thing happened to Joshua in Joshua 3.12. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. Now, at this point in the writing, God doesn't tell him why. He just says, choose 12. Then God gives clear instructions to the priests, and we've been talking about this through the whole series. Uh, The priests, uh, they're Levites, and they they are to carry the ark, the covenant covenant, of, of God, the presence of God into this raging flood waters. And the moment they put their foot in the water, the waters roll back and they stand up. And, you can, and, and how wide, you know, we picture this real small, but it could have been a mile wide. Uh, it, 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 they stand up. The Levites, I want you to see, they're the first ones in. They represent spiritual leaders. They're the spiritual leaders of the nation of Israel who's been in the wilderness for 40 years. The ideal here is that leaders are to lead by example. So mom and dad, you're leaders. Pastors, we're leaders. We are le- grandparents. You are leaders. We lead by faith. The spiritual shepherds of Israel were to be men of faith, and so they went into the water first. And then watch what happens. God, he commands them to go halfway. So the water stands up. They go halfway, and they're standing there with the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders. And, and here's what's happened. They've got to allow about 2 million people to cross through. So, so they cross through, and, and, and see, here's what he's saying to the leaders. You're leaders, and, and I'm telling you as a church, we're crossing through into the promise, a new promise, another promise from God. <clears throat> the leaders have to apply the faith because, you see, in the natural, it looked like, man, that wall could come down any minute, and we're, we're toast. It could give way at any moment, but they didn't do that. Why? Because Israel had a heart change. Why? They now know God. 
in the wilderness, they didn't know God. In Egypt, they did not know God. And that word know in the Hebrew is a word that means intimately. So they did not know God intimately. Now there's been a transition. Now they know God. Now they're ready to go in and take what's theirs because God said, I'm going to hold the waters back. And so <clears throat> here they are. And remember, I've identified this group of people as wilderness babies. They were born in the wilderness. They did not live in Egypt. They did not live in slavery. And so anywhere from 40 to 45 years old is their age, depending on what you look at as a generation in the Bible. Typically, it's 42 years. So anyway, so they're 40, 45 years old. I've been using the number 40 through the series. And so they, they going, they're going in to see their promised land. They were born in the wilderness, and they're going to cross in. They're watching God do this incredible miracle, stand the waters up. And then God says, pick the 12-man team. And then he tells Joshua what to do with these 12 men, Joshua 4.4. So Joshua called the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark, after two million people have passed, before the ark of the covenant, your God, uh, the ark of the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites to serve as a sign among you in the future when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Notice the last line. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Now, these guys have a very unique assignment. And so the people cross through, they go out, they take a good-sized stone or boulder, if you will, and then they go out and they go over and they place it. Now, the people are camped. The, the two million people, where do you put them? They're not standing on the banks. They're moved over on the east border of the Promised Land, a place called Gilgal. And so they go there and they stack these 12 stones up. And then Joshua Here's the second part. He goes back into the river. They're still standing there with the ark, and he takes 12 stones, and he makes a pile of stones, sets up a monument in the middle of the river right at the spot where the priests are standing. So you have two piles of 12 stones, one in the river and one where the people are camping. All of this is done for a reason. We're going to pick up on the significance of this in, uh, for us today, 4,000 years later. And so here, here's what they're telling these people. Listen, we want to do this because in days go going ahead, your children will come by and they're going to say, hey, Dad, what's that pile of stones for? And here's what you're going to tell them. They were building a monument that was a visible reminder to coming generations of the promises of God. We've talked about the promised land represent promises or blessings of God. And we're going to remind people of the coming God, the, 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 the promises of God that are still coming. So parents, tell the children what has happened. Now, listen, the story you tell these people are going to honor, uh, is going to honor God. But the ones you're going to tell them to, that, that you're going to tell the story to, are going to be promised land babies. So now you have wilderness babies going into the promised land, and now they're going to settle in, and they're going to have children. Those children are promised land babies. Let me stop and ask you this, and you can ask it, you can answer it inside. Do you know your family's purpose and destiny? Do you know that one family can make a difference on our earth today? Do you know the gifts and the abilities of your family? Is it possible that you have the spiritual DNA in you to do something great for God's kingdom? Is it possible that if you do not apply yourself that you'll never reach your promised land, your spiritual destiny? And this is what I think. This is my personal opinion. I think we all have the spiritual DNA of God the Father in us. I believe, if you are a believer, I believe you have the spiritual DNA of Father God in you. Jeremiah said it this way, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. There's that word again in the Hebrew, I knew you. That's an intimate word. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. So, let me say this. We need good role models. Joshua's theme, and I've mentioned it several times, is over in, in 24 and 15. He says, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I don't think Joshua was a control freak. I think he was just a man who lived as part of the household of faith and was raising up a household of faith at the same time. I want to encourage you to live in your house a life that values God and values people and especially value the people in your own house because we often have no understanding what our house holds. It wasn't Joshua without his house. 
It was as for me and my house. See, you can't serve God at the cost of your house. And on the other hand, it's not your house without you because you're living without a purpose if you do that. So let, let me go back in history again. Let's go back to Moses. God raised Moses up. He's a type of Christ to get people out of Egypt, to get them out of slavery. This group of people, probably about 2 million people, they are called the fourth generation in the Scripture. They're the fourth generation. This generation has been in slavery all their life. They did not know God. That's why they struggled in the wilderness knowing that a God, not knowing a God that offered them promises. They had no idea what it was all about, and they died in the wilderness. And then after Moses died, Joshua steps in to lead them. Joshua takes now the fifth generation. The people he takes into the promised land are the fifth generation to possess the land. They are wilderness babies. They're probably 45 and under, 40 and under, okay? But when they get into the promised land, they get in and they settle in. What happened to the children or the babies of the wilderness babies? That's the sixth generation. Where did they end up? What Scripture tells us in Judges 2.10. After the whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, that's, all, that's the fifth generation of all died, another generation grew up, sixth generation, who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. They did not know him in intimately. For then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they served Baal. They went into idolatry. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them, and this aroused the Lord's anger. So the sixth generation did not know the things of God. They didn't know God intimately. When that generation, the fifth, had gathered to the fathers, they died. This one grew, rose up, the sixth, and they didn't know God and all the things he did. What's the result of that? Judges tells us in verse 13. Because they forsook him, God, and served Baal and Asherah, then in his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of the raiders who plundered them. He sold them to the hands of the enemies all around whom they were no longer able to resist. Wherever Israel went, whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as he had sworn to them. And they were in great distress. Watch. A generation that did not know God, when the enemy comes against, they are being defeated and they are in great distress. That word will translate today into they snapped. Under the stress and the pressure of life, they snapped. They knew that, watch, they knew the concepts of God, but they did not know God intimately. Listen, it's not enough to teach concepts. They need to know where, they need to know God because in God is where you find your worth and your purpose for your life. And one of the reasons this generation wasn't knowing God intimately is because, watch, because their parents, the wilderness babies, after they get to the promised land, they fail to, to help them find their destiny in life. The parents were so focused on the promised land, and, and now here's what they did. They just instilled the basics, but the basics failed. Why? Because here's why it failed. Because those people, that fifth generation, they did not know their children. They didn't know the bent, the personality, the giftings of their children. They're so focused on the promises of God. They're so focused on this. They don't know their children, and therefore their children don't know God. And in not knowing God, they became desperately stressed, and they snapped. Well, Pastor, how, how do we do this? How, how do our children know God? Well, I'm going to show you the centerpiece of the Scripture. So just stay with me, okay? The centerpiece of the Scripture is a principle. It, it, it's not a concept. It's a principle. And this principle has, is, is unique because it can pivot two ways. So let me say this before I show you this principle. The home is where you learn respect for others, obedience to authority, discipline, and responsibility, Right? The, the home is the thread of the fabric of our culture. If, if the home deteriorates, then our culture deteriorates, right? So here is the centerpiece of this, and it's the fifth commandment that Moses gives us. Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Now, children, until they reach the age of a spiritual accountability, they, they, the parents are representations of God to them. So if they dishonor that, if they dishonor parents, then God becomes a, dis, a stumbling block for children. And honor, let me give you a definition of this because we're going to come back to it several times because he says honor. What does honor mean? Honor is the power of an attitude towards someone that not only views them great but actually makes them that way by submitted and respectful response. So we are to take the esteem reverence and honor that we give God and give it to our parents. Well, well how, how do we do that? As children, how many of you have been a child before? 
Okay, yeah, some of you still are. As children in your house, I think some of you have them, they still live in your house. They, they're under your roof. They, their feet's under your table. They eat the same food you do. The, the, as children, the way you honor your parents is to obey. These people had to have faith in God. They had to obey God. Listen, you can't honor someone you won't obey. Paul comes along in the New Testament, in Ephesians 6, 1, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. There's the word honor, which is the first commandment with a promise. It's going to pivot so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So Paul gives this correct trans interpretation in the New Testament of the fifth commandment. Hey, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. And Paul is saying until you're out on your own and answerable to God, you, you, the way you honor your parent is obey. But now listen, here, here's, here's the pivot on this. A child never becomes a man if he must always just obey his parents. There is a period of controlling and training your children by parents, but there comes a period where there comes a season where there's individual responsibility. So when a young person moves out and resumes a responsibility for themselves, then it's no longer rote obedience. Now the fulfillment of this commandment takes on a different tone. Well, pastor, you're saying we don't honor our parents. Oh, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying now instead of honor, it takes on a new look. It's called respect. So here's what you have. They're grown. They're adults. Now you have one adult respecting and honoring one, and you have another adult respecting and honoring the other. So the role models for growth for children is to obey, and then as adults, respect. And, when that, and, and, and that will bring the promises of the commandment that he talks about. Let, let me reread that in the New King James Version, Exodus 20b in the, back, in the back part of that, okay? That he said that your days, that's your special season. That, that, that's your today of salvation. That's special. May be long, that's enlarged and, and enriched. Upon the land, that's your inheritance, the promises God has for you. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. You can't inherit land that's not in your inheritance. The land is your special place in God already there by your birthright. Listen, if you are a child of God, you have a birthright and you have a spiritual inheritance that's already yours. It's yours, but you have to take it. You have to go in. Another translation says it like this, honor father and mother so that enriched and prolonged will be your special days of inheritance. Your spiritual life will be enriched to the proportion to the lives of your parents and portion to the lives of your parents. So as we honor and respect, God keeps giving the inheritance. As we honor and respect, he keeps blessing us. So the cause is honor and respect. The effect is blessings of the Father. But there is a threat to this commandment. Listen, it's the centerpiece of the Scripture. It's the, it's the heart of this, but there, there's a threat to it. A child who honors an unworthy parent is likely to become like the parent that's unhonorable. Well, why does that happen? Because we become like what we honor. Yes, kids have physical needs, social needs, educational needs, but most importantly, they have spiritual needs. And the pivot of the center point, centerpiece is that the responsibility is on the children to honor, but first the parents have to be honorable. Well, how do we do that? Well, remember, you become like what you honor. So we must learn to honor God the Father, which, which brings glory. And, 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 and to make honorable by lifting him up and giving him thanks and praise. The progression of our spiritual generational blessings begins in the stream of the home. So, so goes the home, so goes the church. So goes the church, so goes the nation. So listen, the, the, uh, stay with me. The, the generational blessing begins in the home, but it ends up flowing into a mighty ocean, this inheritance pool of our blessings, and it's passed down to generation to generation to generation. I believe that every home is only one generation away from losing everything you have in God in the inheritance part. Each generation should be having a deeper relationship with God than the previous. My dad, as a pastor, I should have a deeper relationship with God than he did. My sons and my daughter, they should have a deeper relationship than I do with God. That's the way it's supposed to happen. That's the way God designed it. There's more. There's a double, whatever you want to look at it. Then Paul ends up and says this in verse 4. Fathers, do not exasperate, provoke your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction, the admonition of the Lord. So parents, when parents are not honorable, we, we provoke our children. We exasperate our children to wrath. So why should they honor us if we're not honorable? If we are promised land people and we exasperate our children, they see no future in God or they see no future in church. 
Why? Because God isn't relevant and church isn't relevant. Because we're telling them to do something that we're not doing. So it exasperates them. They're not seeing the, that we know God in the house. We're just telling them what we want to tell them so we'll feel better so they'll go to church. But they don't know God because we're, we're, not, into, we're not into God. We, we don't know God, so we're trying to do this. And what happens is we, we frustrate them. And, 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 and let me say it this way. Let me just bring it right to the present time. The millennials are the most unchurched group in our land. The 20, the 30, 32s, 34s. Most unchurched group in our land. Why are the millennials leaving God? Why are the millennials leaving church? Well, to illustrate that, I, I thought it'd be good that I get some help since this is such a serious topic that maybe this will lighten it up. So I've got some helpers. Hey guys, come on out and help me. Come on, Ollie. Come on, guys, hurry. Here we go, here we go. There we go. I told them not to be afraid of you because all of you used to be boys and girls too. <laughs> and then you grew up and got old. So watch. You can take the churches in our nation and you can sum them up in basically two categories. Not 100%, but the majority. The majority of churches in our country are evangelical or liturgical. So what I want to do is I want to show you something. These eight children represent the Christian homes of evangelical churches. In other words, they represent children that have been brought up in church. They represent biological growth in evangelical churches. So today, when these eight go to college, guess how many of them remain faithful to God in church? Two. Come here, Ollie. Come on. Two. Thank you. I have to watch Ollie. He'll want to preach. <laughs> what about the liturgical churches? Eight. They leave home. They go to college. How many remain faithful to God in church? One. <laughs> One. Good job, Ollie. <laughs> Let's give these guys a big hand. <laughs> you guys can go. Thanks, guys. Now, if I were to present that to a businessman and ask him by that growth rate, how do you see the church? They would say the church is going out of business. But what about our children? What about your children? What about your grandchildren? What about your children that haven't been born yet? What about your grandchildren that haven't been born yet? What about them? If we place our children's spiritual growth at the top of our priorities and the health of the family grows, when the family grows, the church grows, and then the nation grows, and then we're, we're healthy and we're fully alive and we're continuing in the promises, and God passes them on from generation to generation. So to move from the concept of God, this concept, and into the principles of God means we move from head knowledge to knowing God in the heart. The psalmist said in Psalms 127, 3, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him so the psalmist is saying children are a reward and many people do not view their children that way and here's why because they have broken their hearts they've disappointed them maybe even brought shame on the parents and they can't say their children have been a reward so wherever you are in life if you're in that scenario if, if you don't have children if you have grant wherever you are i want you to hear what i'm going to say because your child was a gift to you by god and you help create the body, but the eternal spirit is a gift from God at conception. Never forget, they're a gift, and you are the steward. They're always your children, and you will always steward them, but at different seasons of their life. We, here's what we're supposed to do as parents. Listen to me. We are to help children find out what their gift is, what their bent is that God put in them. And you can't do it by just teaching the concepts. Yeah, you need to go to church. Yeah, you need to join a church. Yeah, No, they, they need to know the principles of God because they need to find out their calling and their worth in life. And one reason we lose a lot of Christian kids is that parents do not help them find what they've been called to do. And here's why. It's not that you don't love them, but here's why. Because many Christian parents are miserable in life, and they don't know what they're supposed to be doing, and so they're not happy, and, and they, they don't love what they're doing, so it makes it difficult for them to steward their kid into finding what they're supposed to do. 
Today in our world, we have a greater focus on our, ever on our kids' activities and sports than we do on spiritual things. The average family will use 15 to 20 hours a week for, for activities. I'm not talking about school and church and family time. I'm talking about outside activities. There's nothing wrong with them in themselves. The number one reason families are not in church consistently, maybe once a month, twice a month, whatever, is th there are so many things going on every day, every week, and, and it seems like you know, the holidays every Monday and recreation, pleasure, and business, and I understand all that. But parents have the responsibility to take a look at their children and say, oh, I see certain things in him. I see certain things in her, and begin to guide them. And it, and it has to start with the parent knowing God and, it, and, and then knowing the child. If you, listen, if you know God and you know the child, I'll guarantee you the child's going to end up knowing God. The generation that just knew the concepts of God couldn't take it any further because when stress came, they didn't have the depth of relationship with God that would stand, so they snapped and looked for something else. What did they turn to? They turned to an idol. What's this generate? What, what is this millennial generation? What are they looking for? I don't know, but they haven't found it in church. They haven't found it in parents. So what are they? They're going to end up with an idol. Is what's going to happen? And our promised land inheritance is to be treated with honor and respect. What does that mean? That means we're not to steal someone's inheritance or sell someone's inheritance. I've already talked about Esau in this in this in this series, but Esau did. He sold his natural and spiritual inheritance. Why? Just to feed his fleshly desires. Esau is a type of a New Testament believer who cares more about pleasures of life than the inheritance of God. And there was no repentance in Esau either. He closed the door and didn't look back. Oh, and there's another example. We have to value the inheritance from the father like Naboth did. You see, Naboth is the guy who has this incredible piece of property, has a vineyard on it, and King Ahab comes and says, I want to buy it. He says, I, I can't sell it, 1 Kings 21.3. For the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my ancestors. This is not an ordinary piece of property. I can't give you this. It's the inheritance of his father. Th this was a spiritual connection to the blessing of Abraham. God forbid that I sell our blessing. So watch, stay with me. The spirit of Ahab symbolizes the abdication of authority. It represents passive authority. He's a king. He's married to a woman named Jezebel. The spirit of Jezebel is a spirit to control not to control the throne, but control the power, be the power behind controlling the one on the throne. So watch, the spirit of Jezebel and Ahab quietly form a codependent relationship, passive authority, and then aggression to control. Both will need to feed off each other in order to accomplish their goals. So Ahab's wimpy spirit is exactly what gives rise to Jezebel's lethal power base. First Kings 21, 25, but there was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged by, on by Jezebel, his wife. I mean, this guy's bad to the bone. Th this guy's horrible. I mean, he, he, just as Ahab, he allowed Jezebel to sacrifice children. He built these places and this worship for all of these things. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it just, it's just a whole collage of things going on. But the, the driving spirit behind this form of worship of offering children, that, 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 that's the same. It's the driving spirit behind abortion today. The spirit behind abortion today is by the Jezebel spirit. But listen, that is in the natural the Jezebel spirit also works in the spiritual. What do you mean? I mean, the Jezebel spirit, this passive authority connected with this aggression to control, it also seeks to spiritually abort those who are young and, imm and, and immature. Your children, your teenagers, your college kids, to get them to abort. So Jezebel got involved. She had Naboth killed so her husband could have a new piece of land, godly inheritance. He takes it. That act got God's attention because Ahab crossed the line of generational blessings and stole at Nahab's inheritance. You see, the judgment for destroying an inheritance is that your inheritance is destroyed. But many feel like this. Many of you listening to me right now say, well, I have no inheritance because of my father and my mother or my grandparents or, or they did this and they did that and they divorced and this and this and this. And, 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 and I just don't believe there are any blessings can ever come to me in my house. Look at me, you're wrong. You're wrong. Let me tell you why. Because your heavenly Father has the ability to change your destiny and restore your inheritance. Say, <clears throat> so, well, I don't have children. Well, you need to impart them into spiritual children. The psalmist said in Psalm 78, 4, we will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. 
So watch, the reason your children's inheritance is so important in our world today is because most, mostly dead people rule our world. Yeah, uh, the, the leaders of, the, the, the initiators and the leaders of communism are dead. Buddhists, Muhammad, Mormons. Our libraries are filled with words and promises of dead people. Christianity is the only religion that's governed by a living God, not from a tomb, but from a throne. A curse can continue for years, but a generation lasts, a, a blessing lasts for generations. And Joshua, remember, we want to be like, he prophesied that the man who would rebuild Jericho would lose his firstborn son. Ahab, hundreds of years later, laid the foundation. His youngest son, Hallel, was hung at the gate. It happened just like Joshua prophesied. See, blessings continue for generations. So let me bring you up to speed. Listen to this quote by Peter Drucker. Every few hundred years in Western history, there occurs a sharp transformation. Within a few short decades, society rearranges itself, its worldviews, its basic values, its social and political structure, its arts, its key institutions. Fifty years later, there's a new world, and the people born then cannot even imagine the world in which their grandparents lived and in which their own parents were born. We are currently living through such a transformation. Here's what he's saying. Culture is shifting. There are major changes happening in the world around us, and I want to make sure as a family, as a church, we're in front of this. So we're not focused on just living in the promise, living in the promise and, and trying to get, see, our ideal of the promise has been so skewed by erroneous teaching in the past that, that no, 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 we, we have to understand what this really looks like. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. I'm going to show you in a minute. But you see, there are major changes going on, and I don't want to focus just in living in the promise and forget that the promise is for my children. I don't want to be so self-absorbed in the promise for me and what I can get that I forget that I have children and my children's going to have children and it's going to go on for a thousand generations. The psalmist said in Psalms 105 and 8, he remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations. The covenant's for a thousand generations. So the story of Joshua that we've spent six weeks in, it happened 2,000 years before Christ. Christ comes to church's birth, and that's been about 2,000 years. So that's, say, 4,000 years. Our theology hasn't changed, but our methodology has to because of a shifting culture. So if you're stuck in the days of old and you're stuck in the, in, 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 in the three songs and a poem, you're stuck in all of those things, we are missing out on a culture. We, I refuse to miss, on, miss out on this culture. I will not, miss, I will not be a gener, one-generational church. I refuse to give in to what my age and my generation wants and desires because you've had your time, you've had your space. And it's time for us to look into the millennials because, listen, it's time will turn around in 20 years and they're going to be the leaders and you're going to have another group coming up and they don't know God if, because they're raising up children and they don't know God. What do we have to do? We have to be strategic. We have to plan. We have to, we have to make this real because this group of people, they know real and they know, they know phony and they know fake. And that's why they're so disgusted with the political system. And that's why they're so disgusted. And what do we do? Those in my generation, 45 years and older, what do we do? We are caught up in this party and that party and who's the president and this and that and, it, and it's like we are so disgusted and we're so caught up in all of this and what's it reflecting back down to that generation and our younger children is fear no faith in that no faith we're looking at the right person the right man and everybody's got an opinion and everybody's got an opinion and you post it and you talk about it what about the opinion of your children who gives you the authority to talk about this and that? Why don't we talk about God's authority and what God is telling us to do with our children? Let's get our eyes off of political situations and let's get our eyes on a living God. Listen, you can do a lot of things to me, but when you come against my children and my grandchildren, it's on. And there's a shifting culture and it's on. And I refuse to lean over here and say, well, I like music this way, and I like it this way, and I like that. Bah humbug, you've had your season and your time. It's time for an army, a family of children and teens to rise up. Why? Here's why. Because what, the, what our culture needs to see is your family being a monument to the people in our world that the promises of God are still yes and amen, and there's no lying and no deception and no deceit in it.
it should be a disgrace for us as Americans to decide who the president's going to be by some Jerry Springer political debate system that's going on, and everybody with the sharpest tongue can outwit the other one. That's not it. What's in a man's heart? What's in a man's understanding? What does a man believe? No, we're so caught up in a culture that's so twisted and so inside out that we have a generation that doesn't know the promises of God. And I'm telling you, church, it's time for us not to tuck our tail and run. It's not to be ashamed of being a believer. It's time to look back to the main thing. What's the main thing? As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, I'm going to follow God. As for me and my house, we're going to put God first. Come on, give God glory. Let's give God glory. Let's don't give man glory. Let's give God glory. We've been in front of this already. We're keeping it on our radar. That's why last year we changed the way we do our children's ministry. We, we got some information from Christians who studied how children learn and the best way to teach them. We've changed all that. Our student ministries, we, we don't do student ministries like old school. Nothing wrong with old school, but it doesn't work today because of the media, the social media these kids are all involved in. We're changing all that. We're working on that. And if you remember on the Vision Sunday, the first of the year, I said we're, we're, we bought land already about 20 minutes from here. We bought 80 acres. We're going to build a retreat center and a camp, and that camp is for your children and your youth, and it's not just a summer camp but it's day in and day out to train them and teach them godly worldviews and, and, and instill in them. And it's for marriages, to have marriage retreats consistently, to have marriages restored there. It, it, here's what God told me. I want you to focus on the family. I want you to focus on your children. I want you to raise up a generation so that when it's time that this generation, this church doesn't miss a mark, this church doesn't miss a stride at all. Why? Because you've done your homework, because you've remained faithful because, listen, those who remain faithful, those who did this, who do this, you know what God said? I'm going to continue the inheritance. I'm going to continue the blessings. And listen, God's not out of blessing. In fact, I think God's got more blessing he knows what to do with right now. And I think he's looking for some people that he can trust. And they not, not trust because you've got some political opinion, not trust because you've got some angle of this and angle of that, but he can trust because you look at the value of your marriage and you look at the value of your children and you say, I'm going to pour into my house. I'm going to pour as for me and my house. We're going to love the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. And God said, I'm going to bless their socks up. I'm going to bless them coming in and going out. Why? Because I want the world to see it. Children will inherit from us either a passion for the things of God or a casual attitude toward God. For a household to thrive in this shifting culture, parents must be letting, must be letting your heart be gripped with a desire for your inheritance. When you do, your children will grow up to become liberated adults who are secure in themselves because they know God. And they're not secure in some professor at a university, not some politician. Not, they know God, and they understand the promises of God and for their children. And, and listen, I, I don't have time to read it. I want to read the whole chapter of, of Deuteronomy 11, but here, you can read it yourself. Here are, listen, here's the promises. Here's the promises for the promised land babies. Power to be strong. Success in possessing land. Length of days. A better land than Egypt. Rains in due season. Abundant crops, days of heaven on earth, complete mastery of enemies, success in all places, no man able to defeat you, fear in the hearts of your enemies, blessings of all kinds. That's the blessing, the inheritance that God wants to put on your house and your children and your children's children. I thank God for my great-grandfather who was a minister and my dad who was a minister for 60 years. I thank God for that. But my responsibility and my, my focus right now is so strong on my three children and their spouses and my six grandchildren because whatever God has put in them, I want God to use that. And I'm fighting for it. And this is what I'm telling you to do. I'm telling you to fight for it. It's worth the fight. I'm telling you to gird up your loins. I'm telling you to fight for it. Don't, don't listen to the system. Don't listen to it. Fight for it. It's your house. 
It, 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 God's over, if God's over your house, then, then fight for it. And, and, and listen, I, I want to I pray over you. But, but, and, and when I end this prayer, listen, there'll be a pastor at every campus come to close it up. And it'll be short, sweet, and, 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 and right to the point. Because here's the point. When I finish praying, and, and we dismiss in a minute, if you, listen, if you are not a child of God, you have no inroad to these inheritances. So if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to come at the end of this service. Everybody will be leaving. You come, somebody will pray with you. And secondly, if the enemy is built, beating you up with guilt and saying, man, I was a lousy parent, I did this and that. Listen, that's not God. That's the enemy. And God, n- none of us are perfect parents and none of us are perfect children. But the enemy won't, why? Because the enemy does not want you in your house to tap into the inheritance because if we do, we will change the world for God. So those two points for you to come for prayer. Let me pray for you. Father, I realize that the greatest blessing I can pass along to the children in my life is the one you've given me, your life, your living word, your Holy Spirit. And I inherited that by the activation of your will at Calvary. And like the blessings of Abraham, I pray that the spiritual inheritance I impart to the children in my life will multiply greatly from generation to generation, that over their lifetimes, my children will be bearers of godly fruit. And all of you pray this with me. To my sons and daughters. i do it again. Say it like you mean it. To my sons and daughters. I speak the blessing of the Lord's inheritance in Jesus Christ over all of them. Amen. God bless you.